Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, all of you geeks, nerds, fanboys and girls around the globe, welcome back to yet another thrilling episode of the Vigilant Geek Podcast. My name is Andrew Puzak of Vigilant Geek Media. And with me, as always, my comic book partner in crime, Holden Orm of Vigilant Geek Media. And we have the esteemed pleasure of uh, having one of uh, our top Vigilant Geek Media analysts back on the show uh, to help us out here this week. Uh, we we have uh, New England stand-up, co- uh, stand-up comedian Nathan Burke. Yeah. Uh, w- I'm welcome like back. Your, welcome I'm, back, Nathan. It's like, it's like, it's we, like I never left. We, yeah, it's, it's, it is actually... <laughs> no, it's great, great having you back on on the show, Nathan. But on the show, yeah. Um, With I su- my mic on. Now this week we are going to focus on Marvel Television. Uh, this is going to include uh, all these great Marvel Netflix series that have been popping up over the past year or so, uh, as well as some of their primetime TV shows like Agents of Shield. Um, so, you know, since it's been proven, uh, time and time again, that these TV series, in fact, uh, are linked to the Marvel Cinematic Universe, uh, in, in, in many more ways than one, uh, they're certainly pertinent to, uh, you know, the overall Marvel universe, uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe, uh, uh, continuity, and uh, I just can't wait to dive in and uh, talk about some of this stuff. So, uh, gentlemen, uh, why don't we start off with, uh, you know, the, the, the big show that's on my mind this big week. Show. Great athlete. World's largest <laughs> athlete. <laughs> didn't he, now, didn't he win the Andre the Giant he award? The uh, Andre the Giant memorial battle royal last year and they're doing another one this year and he plans on winning it again and you know i hope he does until kane came out and confronted him who will also be a participant in yeah the- so, so wait the a minute they're, they're already hyping the pre-main like the main event of the pre-show yes they're uh well is that gonna be pre-show it always is i, I figure because well, last year yeah, it, it, yeah. It was, I guess I don't recall. That part was. has never been actually part of WrestleMania. I don't yeah. believe. Well, it, I think it was. La- it was I mean, the, it was last year. Um, yeah, but I don't know if it was pre. I uh, think it was. They pre- did, show. although like the, the the card on WrestleMania is always like main event after main event after mm-hmm. main event. There's no filler matches. So. I feel like the Under the Giant Battle Royal is basically like throwing it'll throw a bone every year to like a guy who's been there for a long time who's kind of like who's kind of com- a company plateaued guy. yeah like so kane could win it this year as what like was it was cesaro the the swiss superman he won it the year before oh yeah and did, then didn't. and then the big show got i totally it. forgot about that i didn't realize it's been going on for over two years <laughs> yeah. no I, I thought it was just last year in my head it was like just that one year because they must have come out with it two years ago I mean, yeah. yeah do they do they have any more comic book related stuff going on at wwe yet because i know they had steve oh, amell the, last year nah nah nothing like that stardust has kind of fallen uh into the back burner oh man Jobs. Yeah, well, after job. after you get beaten by the arrow, you know, or he's the green arrow an, an now. Actor. <laughs> yeah. Then, uh, yeah. I mean, your where's your credibility go after that? You know, mm-hmm. he looks so ripped on the show, and then like I saw him in the ring, and I'm like, he's gonna get murdered. <laughs> he he was really good at getting his ass handed to him. I remember. <laughs> he, yeah, I, I think that's like the first you learn. Well, he was partnered. He was partnered up with Neville, and Neville's pretty awesome, at least from what I saw. Yeah, uh, he's excellent. Yeah, so so you know, I think he was had a lot of security in that, you know, in his partner, his tag team partner. But uh, no, I think for an actor, I mean, 
you exhibited some skill there. He knew what he was doing. Yeah, he was, he was a re- you could tell he was a wrestling fan, and he like took the time to learn. I think he's Canadian. Yeah, as he likes the Toronto Blue Jays. Um, pretty positive he's a Canadian. So you know, like, Canadians Canadian. love wrestling. That's, that's right. Yeah, just like they love hockey, they love wrestling too. And they love poutine. Oh, it's it's a <laughs> it's a funny sounding thing, but it just sounds so delicious. I've never had it, but it just yeah. it's that gravy shit that people put on French fries, right? Yeah, it's like yeah. gravy and yeah. cheese curds melted on French fries. It's, oh wow, it just sounds like a heart attack. It like is instant heart attack. I've had it once. But what a not, heart not, a heart attack? Yeah, I've had a heart attack. Well, that'll uh, how heart much, that'll make about a baker's dozen for me, Bab. <laughs> nah, that, <laughs> that or blowfish, poutine and blowfish and bacon explosions. Yeah. Hey, by the way, you promised me a bacon explosion, Holden. Uh, I'm still I, waiting on that. I still have. I have everything I need to make it upstairs, but I'm I'm doing it as a surprise appetizer for uh, Easter dinner. At well, all right. Though well, that's Easter dinner, but you still owe me one too. All right. Just anywho, just call me out. Bacon explosion. That's my Grateful Dead. Now, gentlemen, <laughs> I know uh, I have seen. I've seen all of what Marvel has put out with Daredevil. Uh, I know you guys are still behind a little bit, but let's talk about it. It is definitely one of the coolest things out on. Uh, on Netflix for sure, probably the cool. Well, in in the top coolest things that Netflix offers, I'd say the Netflix series uh, Daredevil. My my favorite thing about the show is that Marvel has been about family values for 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 it feels like forever. And oh, whenever yeah. they go ahead and they create media media outside of the books, you kind of lose that gritty, um, noir crime feeling that you get with uh with daredevil especially but with the other books as, as well that kind of it loses some of its edge and they they after the first scenes the uh, first season this agents of shield it was just like oh because it kind of felt like they were going down this road where like they're going to be putting out mediocre things but then they hooked up with netflix and it's just so good you don't have uh you know it's like censorship that you'd have on mainstream television so uh, i get what you're saying um they can play around with a lot more of the bloody you know the blood and guts and gore they can play along with uh play along they can uh, play around with uh, a lot of adult themes that you 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 know you 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 can't really show on on mainstream television you know especially you know at at, at prime time uh slots you know time slots so yeah you get to see like you know you get to see some of these dark crime noir stories or you know almost flat out thriller horror stories when you talk about like jessica jones maybe you get to see the you know them portrayed in live action the way they're supposed to be portrayed it's great i like it i like the grittiness Oh, yeah. It's like, you know, the way they portray Hell's Kitchen just, you know, as a setting, it's just such an armpit. It reminds me of, like, Lawrence, Massachusetts or something, but <laughs> but worse. Well, I mean, don't don't bring it down that much. <laughs> I, uh, no, like, I like, I just like the idea of... Uh, them having the freedom to have a show not on TV and having it like kind of dark and gritty and like because if you have that sort of environment while you have your characters trying to like watch their curse words, yeah, it kind of <laughs> takes you out of it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, oh shoot! Like, <laughs> now people just they, instead of swearing, they just yell more. Like, yeah. oh, thanks! <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're welcome. Darn it! No, um. Yeah, these these Netflix series aren't holding back, especially you look at Jessica Jones and all the dialogue uh, in that show. Mm-hmm. They didn't hold back very much at all. And, and, you know, that that's the way Brian Michael Bendis wrote the dialogue in the Alias book. So it, you know, it's a it's a, it's an excellent portrayal of that because, you know, it, it, not that like, you know, just because uh 
a TV adaptation of, of a book has swear words. That That's not what makes it good. What makes it good is that it follows the source material very well. You know, so I like the fact that just swearing is not a popular thing among the public, but a majority of the people who speak use those words. So when you have that in the media that you're watching, it creates a more natural feel. Right. You feel like you actually like, wow, this is very plausible because people are talking like people talk. And that's how you would react. Yeah, I mean, it's someone... it's more realistic, and that's what they're going for. You know, they're taking characters like Daredevil and, and you know, Luke Cage, and Luke Cage has, you know, impenetrable skin, and obviously that's complete nonsense you know but they're they're making you know the whole world that he lives in or or daredevil or pick you know whoever you know they make they're making it it, as realistic as possible and it's just it makes everything you know the whole story itself it just makes it more believable and part of that is the dialogue it's it's just you know just like the guys from SwearNet, even you know like this is how people fucking talk you know (laughs) it's true yeah i think that all changed with like the dark knight where people like oh you can have kind of like a an an a grittier, like, dark thing that won't, like, scare children, you know? Yeah. Because usually superhero movies were just like, yeah, but it has to be kid-friendly. No. Like, well, with the Netflix... Generally. With the Netflix series especially, mm-hmm. like, this is for the adults who grew up with these characters. Yeah. It's for grown-ups. Like, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> it's for the... Well, not not really grown-ups, but for the, for the big kids. No, you know? Ty- Tyler. Big kids. Tyler, we can't watch this. We, we can't, can't watch this. It's for big kids. We can't watch Jessica Jones. It's for grown-ups. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it most certainly is for grown-ups um they, they haven't skimped on any of the quality like daredevil has like legitimately like 15 minute choreographed <laughs> fight scenes it's rated oh my R. god yeah it's rated r oh it's dude. rated r yeah <laughs> um some of the best fight scenes i have ever seen on it on screen anywhere have come from that show and uh We'll talk season two in a minute, and we'll talk that completely unbelievable, like, 15-minute fight sequence that Daredevil has with the uh, dogs of hell, this biker gang that storms the building that he's standing on the roof of. Yeah, he just takes on the entire mo- motorcycle club. And, and it le- meanwhile, fucking levels them. And then just goes through them one by one, just... and just wastes them and then at the same time he's trying to protect the the punisher who he had um who he had finally bested on the roof because the punisher right. had gotten him the best of him twice before that so he sticks the punisher in an elevator and like hits the down button and meanwhile he takes the hand down stairwell and just crushes one by one by one by one by one um, and it's like just like the big fight scene from season one when he's in the black garb and he's saving the the child that was kidnapped. Um, that was such an epic fight. I think that was the best fight scene of season one. Yeah, it was, and it rivals the scene we were talking about in season two. But in every one of those like big fight scenes they have with uh, the character with Daredevil, you know, it's like. He, I love how Charlie Cox, uh, the actor that that plays Murdoch, I love like, you know, he gets to a certain point after he's like probably taken down like 20 to 30 some odd guys. And like he like shows that exhaustion that Daredevil has like he's like barely able to stand, but he's still he's still like fighting. He still can keep going and punch and kick, even though he can like barely stand. But like it's like for a few seconds there, you like you, you know, as the viewer, you notice like, OK, uh, we're, we, you know, keep in mind here like, oh, yeah, I forgot this guy's still just a man. You know, he's still like, he's just a human being doing this, and he's blind. Yeah, Dude, like that- holy, like it brings, it like shows showing that exhaustion shows his humanity, and it's really cool. You know, because like you know, before like in superhero movies, like you look back at like some of the older ones, like you know, the the, the hero is shown to be like close to invincible almost. You know, in almost every one. You know, and, and, and now it's just everything is so much more realistic and cool, 
and they follow the source material and then because that's like where everything is butted from yeah it's just just, it really felt like he'd been getting his ass just handed to him like the like the previous two episodes and then oh the punisher like just stomped all over his ass but he he, you know at the same time like stomped a mud hole in him oh he really did he really did like i mean if the punisher the punisher would have killed him for getting in his way if the punisher didn't believe like if frank castle didn't believe in what what murdoch was doing you know like he thinks he's a pussy because he won't finish the job like he even you know gives him the shot to kill him he gives him the shot yeah he's got him he's got him all chained up and uh on the rooftop and he gives him the gun he tapes the gun to to his hand to daredevil's hands and you know he's like uh he gives him this big speech like i think you're a half measure I think you're a man that can't get the job done. I think you're a coward. Yeah, and oh, then he, yeah. and then he's like, oh, like he's like, I think you're a moo cow. <laughs> <laughs> so he's trying to get Daredevil to like, you know, shoot him to to, to like to kill. He wants to see him kill, you know. But Daredevil's not gonna do that, and he instead he uses the gun to bust himself free. And, and then he just beats up yeah. an entire MC. That kind of yeah. renewed my my faith in the character because even though he had the sweet armor. It just like uh, well no he had to, he had some good scenes in the very first episode with those bank robbers and then the uh, yeah yeah and then dealing with the arms dealer and those thugs just like thugs just can't even handle him now that he's got that armor yeah oh it's so cool um where was so where where was I here I mean we I can keep talking season two um I want I, I want to get into like how well Frank Castle was portrayed by John Bernthal um I suppose we should just hit season one with a few key points before we do that though um obviously season one was like an all out drag out smash mouth good versus evil fight between Murdoch and Fisk and it was great it really paid homage to that rivalry so well Vincent D'Onofrio played an excellent Will, uh, Wilson Fisk um I don't know it's it's really hard to like you know find anything wrong with season one it that's was, for sure it was the classic daredevil tale it really was, because that's the main rivalry. If you're going to boil it down, you know, like Kingpin is like the major antagonist for the Daredevil. The Daredevil exists because of guys like Fisk, specifically. Yeah. And yep. they've always had it out with each other, you know? And, and it's like one of those rivalries that's like right up there with uh, Batman Joker. Oh, God, yeah. Batman Joker, Flash Reverse Flash, uh... Luther Superman. Luther Superman. I, this one is just as big. It's just the story itself, you know, being always being you know, the classic fringe story that it was. Uh, probably didn't get the readership that a, a Batman or a Superman book would get, but you know, it definitely got its readership um, um, and cult following. You know, myself being a esteemed member of that cult, I love. <laughs> I uh, I freaking I love daredevil i've read miller's version of daredevil i've read bendis's i've read wade's i've read uh, a bunch of people soul's doing a pretty good job right now. and right now actually i'm very very pleased with what charles soul is doing with the book and uh the whole 10 fingers gang versus the hand and blind spot uh you know uh, and, and we all thought it was like gambit he looks kind of like gambit he did yeah. um before we got into the first issue of da- of the new da- uh, daredevil run uh it, it, it's this new cool character blind spot i um not to get too off task but uh, you know it, it's just the story's been great no well, it's very related and then once again uh in the in season one daredevil had a black costume well he's got it now and he's now he's got it in the books yeah, you know, he's still got like the horned cowl. It still looks good. Um, yeah, it's, it looks it looks fucking cool. Yeah, he's got like the red helmet, so he's still got like the devil look. But yeah, like like he's got like the black going on, and it's just it's it's one of his cooler looks. Um, Black's always cool. Oh, it is. It is. Um, 
you know what's really funny is 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 looking at a picture of the current costume uh, and then comparing it to Ben Affleck's costume in the 2004 uh, feature film Daredevil, which mm. is the only other live action portrayal they have had of the character. But it's pretty funny to compare. Now, you know, for what that movie was, I uh, actually that was a decent flick. I, I liked it. I thought it was good. It was a, it was a really good portrayal of the character itself. Um, I thought like you know they might have squished a little too much into a into a two hour feature film. Uh, when you have a feature film, you got to kind of focus on some of the big points, and you know. I don't know. They save it for the sequel. Well, I mean, they they could have if they made made enough money with the first one, and if they had the contracts to do it. But um, unfortunately, not. But I mean, there's some things I would take out. I I would I would have probably kept Bullseye, kept Kingpin, gotten rid of Elektra. Oh, so yeah, that's a whole Bullseye. separate story, and had that Colin, sort of incorporate. Colin Farrell did Bullseye. Yeah. Yeah, he actually was not bad. The whole yeah. scene with him going through airport security and they're like, "Hey, we found a paper clip in your mouth." That was unnecessary. I <laughs> yeah. thought they could that. <laughs> Other than that though, I thought everything was really well done. You know, like my sick sense of humor I thought was so funny was when Bullseye was on the plane and the, like the old lady was sitting next to him and she's she's, she's talking his ear off like and my grandson, he works with computers, and he knows how to figure out everything with computers, but to heck if I know, blah, 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 blah. And uh, Bullseye takes, like, one of the peanuts <laughs> that they give you at the air, you know, the stewardess gives you, <laughs> and he flicks it into the lady's mouth and chokes her to death, and she <laughs> she passes out dead, like, on his arm, like, on his shoulder, and the stewardess comes by and says, oh, isn't that just precious? Like, the old lady's, like, taking a <laughs> nap on his shoulder but really he did, like in order to shut her up he like murdered her with a peanut <laughs> oh man yeah i mean that, that that's probably like like again another scene i'd take out you know but like as a whole their first attempt at an on-screen live action daredevil wasn't horrible and affleck was actually uh, a big comic guy uh growing up and he was very much into the character growing up and he wanted to do the character justice um i don't know i mean like they did good i don't know what it was that critics didn't like about that movie I mean, it wasn't for them. You know, no one makes movies for critics. Yeah. What, what, are, like, what are these? They mostly just failed filmmakers who are like, good at writing articles. Yeah, they don't know what it's like to create something. So, you know, they're just going to like, you know. Maybe they did it once and they were too sensitive after people criticized their work or something. Yeah. So, so they don't know. They don't know. They don't know what they're talking about. Usually it's usually just, you know them keeping their reputations up by dirting on something you know and that's all it is really yeah um such is life you know the people a lot of the people that get ahead in this world have to step on other people to to do so uh unfortunately when you live in a capitalist society that's sort of how things go it's ah, just darwinism see here but um get getting back to to our one of our favorite shows here, Daredevil. Um, so season one ends. Uh, Daredevil callers Fisk saves the day. Um, yada yada yada. End end of story. You know, uh, close the curtain. Um, it was done really well. Um, and then season two just just f- starts off with a bang like they they do not waste time like with anything any kind of like you know boring or melodramatic scenes or you know extensive dialogue like it is like matt versus frank like blood and guts it's highly entertaining shit and let me tell you um i am a huge huge fan of the thomas jane punisher and I have a lot of respect for the Ray Stevenson Punisher. Uh, I thought, in, in regards to looks, 
Ray Stevenson looked the most like the Punisher from the comics. You know, he had the stature, he had the hair, you know, he was kind of like this Frankenstein that, you know, shows up in the corner of a big mob gathering and just kills everyone. Like, that's so, that's how the Punisher should be portrayed, you know? He's, he's like this boogeyman for, for evildoers, you know, for wrongdoers. Uh, he's, he's the guy that's going to provide said punishment. Um, yeah. Uh, so, you know, pretty simple concept, you know. Um, you know, I even, like, sort of respect Dolph Lundgren's Punisher. I mean, that movie sucked, but uh, it was their first attempt at that character in live action on screen. And they had him doing naked yoga in the sewer a lot. And, like, you know, he didn't have the skull at all. Which I got to see this movie. Yeah, if you if you like like Dolph Lundgren naked guy ass from like sure. the, the 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 late nineteen eighties and then this movie might be for you. I'll huh? take a triple helping. <laughs> <laughs> but like not the correct portrayal of Frank. You know, he got I don't think he even had any dialogue, come to think of it. Frank does talk here and there. Um Otherwise, he's just the boogeyman for criminals. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, lo- I love the Thomas Jane movie. That was um, good. You know, it, it, it was a great portrayal of the character, um, like at least the, the origin. Um, although they went like a little crazy. Like, like they, they told the origin perfectly in Daredevil Season 2. We'll get to that. But um, they had like this big like mow down of like hundreds of Frank's relatives like on the beaches of Miami or something at a family reunion. It was like a little bit overkill, but uh I mean like the movie as a whole, like like Thomas Jane is an excellent Punisher and if you've ever seen the uh fan film on YouTube, look it up on YouTube. It's called Dirty Laundry. Uh it's Thomas Jane playing Frank Castle again because he loves the character. Uh, he's damn good at playing it um, in like a small Frank Castle tale. And uh, who's the guy that played Hellboy? I'm trying to think of his Ron name. Ron Perlman. Ron Perlman. Yeah, Ron Perlman's in it as well. And it's just an awesome, awesome short film. Um, but getting back to uh, Daredevil Season 2, John Berthal's portrayal of Frank was by far the best portrayal of Frank. I hate to say it because, like I said, I am a Thomas Jane fan, um, and I thought Ray Stevenson looked the part very, you know, very well. But no one's going to be able to compete now with with John Bernthal's portrayal because he really captured the essence of Frank better than anyone else did. Like. The death of Frank Castle's family, uh, it messes him up. Like, he is a psychopath. He's nutso. He's crazy. Bonkers. The guy's unstable. Like, you know, you look at Thomas Jane's portrayal or Ray Stevenson's, and it's almost like a Bruce Wayne, very stoic, very together, like, very tactical. And the Punisher's all those things when he's, like, you know, doing his thing. But... The Punisher is a fucking nutcase. Frank Castle is a nut job, and John Berthal's portrayal captured that in spades. It was so cool. I mean, they had this whole, uh, you know, little mini arc within like the big arc of that was season two of Frank Castle, the trial of Frank Castle, and Mur- uh, Nelson and Murdoch, of course, representing Frank and. Uh, they're trying to take down this corrupt DA, but Frank at the end, like, fucks it all up because he just, like, you know, he's an honest man. Um, and he's honest about what he does, and he thinks that what he does is right. You know, he murders people, but he murders murderers and criminals and sex offenders or what have you. Um, and at the, you know, they're, they're trying to get Frank, uh, a lighter sentence and uh, treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder. And he finally snaps on, on the stand, you know, 
it's a saying that it's a it's a it's a disrespectful for people that really do have PTSD. I don't have PTSD. I'm not crazy. I know damn well what I'm doing, and I'd do the same goddamn thing again. If you're a scum or a murderer, you're going down. I'll kill you. I'll kill every last one of you. And like he just goes off on the stand, and it was great acting from John Berthal, and it really captures the essence of Frank Castle. Like he, like you know, he's a good man in a sense where he's never ever gonna harm an innocent person but if you're scum or if you're you know dealing drugs or killing people or raping people or whatever it is like he is going to find you and put a bullet in your head if you're lucky and i just can't say enough about how well he was portrayed in season two um there was also electra in season two I'm not going to give away a hell of a lot about that, um, mainly due to the fact that I know Holden, Holden, you haven't gotten to that part yet, and I don't want, I'm going to give you the bare bones, but I'm not going to try to, I'm going to try to negate as much as I can. All right, time to just rip the band-aid off. I know it, but, but you really got to see it for yourself. It's great, because... Well, it's not like I'm just like, oh, I got, I got the cliff notes from Andrew. The show's great. <laughs> no, I'm, de- I'm, I'm definitely going to finish watching it. <laughs> no, See, I know. Like I did on my Shakespeare essays. <laughs> <laughs> oh, everyone used Cliff Notes. Sparks Notes. Spark I, Notes, yeah, yeah. I love Sparks Notes, yeah. yeah. Um, Sparks Notes aside... Uh, what were we talking about? Yeah, so we, we, we also got to see Electra, and, you know, for once, she was portrayed properly. Um, you know, they went really heavy with, you know, the lovey-dovey stuff uh, in that 2004 Daredevil flick. And then uh, Jennifer Garner, who... I'm, I mean, she's a good actress, but that role was not for her. I don't think. No. Well, um, she had a solo Electra movie that f- just plopped. Uh, but it did lead to a nice long failed marriage. Oh yeah, yeah until uh, Batman met Harley Quinn, and that's all there is to say about that. Let's see, <laughs> I actually haven't heard too much of that gossip. I try to stay away from uh, Hollywood gossip myself, but mm-hmm. uh, the big man Ben Affleck. Bruce Wayne, he just couldn't keep his little bat in in, in the in his bat in the bat, cave. In, in the bat cave. Yeah, when he saw uh, Margot Robbie's portrayal of Harley Quinn, which we will get to see this spring in Su- was, Suicide Squad. I thought he was banging the babysitter. Maybe. Oh maybe. well, th- I think it was a combination of things because um, I did hear that as well. I could understand Margot Robbie. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, seducing, absolutely gorgeous. Seducing the Crazy. Batman. Yeah, I mean, he's Batman now, so, you know, he's kind of like the king of everything. Maybe that's his thing. Every time Ben Affleck does a superhero movie, he ends up getting a different spouse. The only reason he lasted with Jennifer Gardner for so long is because it took him forever to do another superhero movie. Right. Actually, right. Yeah, that's, it. that's that's why it happened. Because his, uh, his first big uh, relationship... Um, was when he portrayed the superhero Gili. <laughs> Mar- Marvel's Gili. You know, <laughs> that relationship would have probably continued if uh, if that movie had done well. Yeah. I feel. Him and J-Lo. It was just too much of a black mark every time he saw her. And he just remembered how, how horrible the, the movie idea came. idea for Gili. <laughs> 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 Let me tell you something. If Stan Lee came up with the idea for Gili, you'd never, ever get him to admit that one. Because I know I wouldn't. <laughs> he would probably he would probably admit it. Yeah, <laughs> he would probably brag about it for some reason. Yeah. Like, well, I came up with the idea for Gili. <laughs> <laughs> um. Anyways, um, getting back to what we were we were saying. I'll say um, this about Gili. Not <laughs> not as horrible as it was. Like it's kind of like the notorious hor- like worst film ever. Yeah. It, it's sort of like the he go-to. was with Jennifer Lopez in that, right? Yeah, I think the uh, the only horrible thing I is like everyone's it. 
expectations. Are <laughs> you sorry? Not in theaters. I, I watched it on TV. It was like on TV once. And yeah, I no, it. that's it, it. It feels like your typical on TV movie. Yeah. It was. It wasn't good, but it wasn't like the worst movie. There are worse movies. Why are we talking about Geely right now? Because I ben came Affleck up with the idea it? for Marvel's Geely. <laughs> Oh, oh, that would ruin everything for Marvel. <laughs> like no one would watch. They'd recover from it. <laughs> no one would watch it. Any no more. Uh, no Iron Man four. That's for sure. They'd go stick it like on the back burner, like they do with like Howard the Duck and everything else. <laughs> I, you I, see, I, like Ben Affleck holding Jennifer Garner inside one of those like cages in the collector's room in nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> and over there, yeah, I got Geely. Uh, yeah, we think in a few more years. I feel like we're gonna give it another go. <laughs> this is the remedy to fix the Fantastic Four franchise. What we're gonna do is Fantastic Four two. The return of Geely. <laughs> <laughs> at, the, at this point, anything would be an improvement. So, what, you know what? Hell, I, I'd see. Fuck you. You'll see it. <laughs> you, you'll see it. You'll see it. <laughs> you watch it. Yeah, you watch it. You'll oh, see uh, it. Tipty tilly till till tum. <laughs> Suckers like <laughs> us yeah. always go and see it, too. Yeah. That's why yeah. I watch every. That's why I watch wrestling every week, too. Even if it's bad, that's it. Usually, you is. see it. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck you. You watch it. <laughs> they just get emotionally abused, and then they finally do the one episode where it's like, yes, yeah, yes, yeah, right. You gotta go through hell before you get to heaven, man. Yeah. Well, I guess things can't be great all the time. Otherwise, yeah. they'd be bad. Except for the fact that, like, you're devoting time. You could probably use on something way yeah. better. And then it. That, see there. Their goal is to lower your expectations so when something cool happens, and yeah, like, you can like, act wicked excited. That's awesome when it should be kind of awesome the whole time. <laughs> well, there's no reason why it couldn't be. It's melodrama too, so you can do huge things every ep- like every time you do a taping. Like If you have a different heavyweight champion every week, that's fine. Yeah. It can be done. Yeah. The problem with this... I, I won't get I won't stick on wrestling for too much, but I'm I'm just gonna say the the issue with wrestling right now is all the injuries. Is there's every, too many good people injured? All the yeah. Seth Rollins, Cesaro's injured still. Um, oh, I didn't know he Cena. was hurt. I was wondering why he wasn't around. Cena, Sting is probably retiring. Chris Benoit. Chris Benoit's injured. <laughs> <laughs> he's on the he's on the DL. Chris Benoit, uh, Dusty Rhodes. Uh, Chris Benoit has to pay a fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's suspended. <laughs> he was on PEDs. You're That's why. suspended. He was on PEDs. <laughs> you murder your family and kill yourself under t- contract. <laughs> you're suspended. You're lucky you're not fired. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man! Well, getting back on task. <laughs> um, just a, f- a few last words about Daredevil season two. Um, this portrayal of Elektra, played by the lovely Elodie Young, um, was the most accurate portrayal I have seen yet. They really dive into Elektra's bloodlust uh, and how she was pretty much brought up that way and didn't really have a prayer of. Uh, uh, being anything else but a killer. Um, they also uh, incorporate uh, the hands, uh, and you get to see like a really awesome showdown uh, with, with, with you know, numerous members of the hand. Stick shows back up. He's in the picture. You got Electra, and then, of course, you got Dee Dee, and uh, it's sort of like a big you know, melee event, you know, uh, ninja battle royale, and uh, it's way cool. It's way cool. Um, and, you know, Frank Castle is got his hands in, the, you know, the, the plot lines of this season all the way from beginning to end. So uh, if you're a Frank Castle fan, if you're a fan of The Punisher, uh, do not worry. You will see Frank in every single episode, and he'll be doing something badass. Hands down. 
Um, you know, for me to, I just want to reiterate that for me to crown John Bernthal as the greatest Punisher um, that has ever been seen on screen, I mean, that is a very big deal. Uh, the fact that anyone has surpassed Thomas Jane's efforts uh, is, is a huge milestone in film. And in particularly in Marvel Comics and Marvel Cinematic Universe history. So um, with that, let's move on and let's talk about another Marvel Netflix masterpiece that was Jessica Jones. Jessica Jones. Jessica Jones. Jessica 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 Jones. Jessica. Jess, do it. Um. Yeah. No. I. I. I loved that. That. Uh. First season of Jessica Jones, and I'm excited for the second season. I thought it was a cool, uh, way to sort of push the envelope as far as what you can do with a with a superhero series. Because when you first start watching it, you don't even know it's a superhero series. It doesn't even feel like one. No. If you're an outsider, you don't know who the characters are. Because I remember watching it. I was watching it with my dad. And I was like, let's watch Jessica Jones. And he was like, oh, what's that? <laughs> and, he was like, was like, and he loved it. But he didn't know starting out. John it, John Burke gave Jessica Jones two thumbs up. That's about, it. that's all you need to know. He also watches Once Upon a Time and everything else that like a 13-year-old girl would watch. <laughs> so Just so long as he's there. got a nice, tall, cool Budweiser in his hands. He, <laughs> yeah. doesn't, he doesn't give a shit what's on TV. And he's recently gotten into Total Divas, apparently. So. <laughs> <laughs> he likes teenage girl shows. It's well, very... it probably gets the juices flowing. So <laughs> it, might, it might. It, it might. could. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No. He only, he only watches the news because because uh, some of the anchor women are hot. <laughs> <laughs> so if John but, Burke puts his seal of approval on something, you know it's legit. So. Right. He loved that Jessica Jones. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, you're right about that. It had the feel of just like you know, like a thriller type show. Mm -hmm. You know, like a like a murder mystery slash yeah. thriller. Because starting out, the superpowers like are so subtle. Yeah, she doesn't like, like to like like she doesn't broadcast them for, for yeah. by any means. She she's very secretive. Jessica's very secretive about what Maybe, she can do. Yeah. And you get a little like foreshadowing here and there about it, and be like, "Oh, what was that about?" Like, if you if you're really unfamiliar with the characters, like I was, like I knew it was a superhero series, but I didn't really know what their powers were. I didn't know anything about it. So, right. Well, going into it, I was like, I was like, "Huh, I wonder what that's about." You know? Yeah. Like she'd punch someone and they go flying or whatever. Yeah. Like, oh, be like, hey. be like, huh. <laughs> <laughs> Look yeah. At that. There, it was very, it was very neat how they kind of like very slowly and subtly like gave viewers like a taste of her what she can do up until you know I think you really get a good you know good glimpse of Jessica's powers I think uh, the first time she teams up with Luke Cage to fight yeah. whoever whatever thugs they were fighting or you know I kind of forget but I think that's were, yeah what was it they were looking for that kid no the first time it was like that uh uh the cheating wife ended up uh told the husband and the husband brought his rugby team to the bar and then Jessica was like oh no and then oh, showed yeah. up and then they got into that huge bar fight yeah right that's what it was yeah breaking like pool sticks over like uh uh what's his name's back there and he was like yeah it's like he was just invincible like impervious yeah. to th stuff and then you were like huh nah <laughs> <laughs> what's that about it must have been real refreshing for you even i'm not that familiar with the characters so yeah. like so for somebody like cool you who's like just kind of discover it yeah to just kind of like see something for the first time and like have your opinion definitely just be your own and and on um no one trying to sway you one way or the other, you know? Mm hmm It's been nice. And I loved how uh, the villain there... Um, oh, Kilgrave is my Kilgrave. favorite part of the whole thing. He was so... It, he was also not not subtle, but in the way that like he clearly lived his life like under the radar. He's like such yeah, a, yeah. Like, such a sociopath. He, just because he can. Like he, that's his power is almost to be discreet. And, like, oh, yeah. He can, he can just convince people to not... 
Like people just do whatever he says, yeah, so you not can just live them. wicked comfortably. And the power of persuasion. And it was yeah, so it was interesting. I I liked how it was kind of like a gritty crime drama first. Well, like the first couple episodes, series. all you hear about from Kilgrave is just like things he's done, mm-hmm. and like all these horrible things fucking, he's like, made people do. Like yeah. Support groups. Yeah, like the best around them. Oh yeah. And then, like, he just makes people do things. Obviously, there was, like, like, whoa. And then you finally end up meeting the character, and it's just, like, whoa. Obviously, there was a pretty big, like, uh, like rape undertone to that. Well... To like him basically Let's just what, like I guess manipulating one, women and using or just no like, like he that. definitely did or any yeah he did a lot of that too but just the fact that you're telling somebody to do something and they're not they don't have any choice guess, in the matter it, yeah it was like them, so I like every time were. he uses his power he rapes somebody right so that was kind of, I feel like that was like a big uh, sort of statement on that like I feel like they were kind oh, of oh big time making a big uh, sort of that was like a huge undertone to that obviously there's I mean there's a huge not to get too far into like feminism, but there's a huge feminist undertone, and and to Jessica Jones, to right? Jessica Jones, and, and feminist is not you know a derogatory term. It's it's uh, it's almost you know become a genre in a way uh, in, in in film and TV nowadays. But um, no, it's just like empowering for women mm-hmm. um, when she uh, well they say that when she has that crazy sex scene with Luke Cage uh, in the beginning of the season towards the beginning um, that that was extremely uh, empowering and a feminist scene because it's her decision to you know take him and his big member and and you know and and then uh, presumably how she stands <laughs> how she you know over the course of the season you know to change gears here a little bit um you know, over the course of the season, as she's like slowly and surely able to stand up to Kilgrave and uh, um, sort of, uh, you know, not be as affected by his persuasive powers to the point where she can outsmart him. That's really the only way you can beat Kilgrave is by outsmarting him, um, and she's capable of doing so. And and that's another like feminist type achievement there that's empowering for her to meet the you know meet her arch nemesis the guy that ruined her life and and you know did all these horrible things to her and 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 to face her fear in that horrible man and and then uh uh overcome that um now jessica (laughs) <laughs> so you know not to dive too far into that but yeah. you know much like you know uh the last mad max installment was a feminist movie where you have furiosa kind of uh being uh the anchor for max to kind of like keep him sane enough to to you know uh keep going Real yeah. Joan in, in of that Arc movie, shit. yeah, it, it, it's just it's not it's not a derogatory term. It's just what it is, I guess. Uh, Max know? was very much a fly on the wall in that movie. That movie was not about him. Yeah, he was there so that this story about Furiosa uh, and escaping with the breeders, and, exactly, and going back so that that story can be told. And it was a very good story. It was a feminist story. But that's just, it's empowering towards females. That's all it means. It doesn't mean it's like has to be degrading towards males or it has to be a chick flick. Um, so I, I don't guess, think anyone was saying that, Andrew. <laughs> and no, no, no one was. No one was. I'm just trying to, you know, be as clear and concise mm-hmm. as possible. And uh, Did you see that SNL sketch of them doing like the, the feminist song? No. And they're like... They're like, this is not a feminist song. Because like, they're just like, they're, they're saying it's like such a, a minefield to like tip through, toe through. Because like they don't know how to like approach it. <laughs> it was pretty funny. Because <laughs> there's so many different things that like you like could offend people with or like get on the wrong side of. Oh my God. Like so many. I feel like there's a lot of, there's this many sects of sects sects s-e-c-t of feminism as there are like christianity there's like different belief structures built oh, God, oh yeah, there are like, compete with each other there are so it is yeah. kind of a minefield to walk through so 
uh, the best thing three to boys <laughs> talking about it probably isn't the best forum for it but no definitely not and we're not going to talk about it much longer but i guess the best thank god <laughs> <laughs> no the best thing to do is avoid it at all costs yeah. obviously but right. you know if you're encountered you know just just tread lightly and everything will be fine but yeah back to jessica jones um she herself, rough, gritty character, you know, she's got the leather jacket look going on. She yeah. drinks and smokes. and That's what I liked about her. Yeah, and obviously she's... Real rough around the edges, clearly dealing with some baggage. Big time baggage, obviously, like... My type of gal. <laughs> she's not the kind you'd bring home to mother. <laughs> <laughs> she's a super freak. Super freak, she's super freaky. Down, 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 down. Well, well down, down. shout out to Tony Moschetto for his super freak <laughs> joke. Uh, I remember rem- that. I remember that. Actually, yeah. I'd she's lo- got incense wine and candles. Incense wine and candles. Such a freaky scene. He's like, Stop. He goes, he goes. It's not freaky. That's romantic. <laughs> Such a freaky scene. Yeah. It's like this <laughs> lady spent. Shelled out all this money for incense, wine, and candles, and you walk in and you go, such a freaky scene. What a dick. <laughs> such a uh. freaky scene. <laughs> the dick. girl's a super freak. <laughs> it's a great old, anyway, old so Tony Moschetto joke. Yeah, shout out to Tony. He always made me laugh back in the day great, when I used to. local comic. Yeah, when I used to go to the local shows and see you guys. Uh, Tony Moschetto has all, always had a lot of laughs come from him. <laughs> Great, great stand-up comic. Um, but yeah, the super freak Jessica Jones, um, you know, she's kind of a full-blown alcoholic. She's dealing with baggage, you know, instilled from Kilgrave. Um, she has a small support system in her friend uh, Patsy Walker. She goes by Trish in the show. Um, that's like her, like... Patsy's a nickname, and Trish is like her main yeah, name. Yeah, wasn't she like a child actor? And yeah, she was chi- on a show yep. called Patsy. Like, yep. Yeah, Patsy. yeah, yeah. And then her parents pretty much just, her mother in particular, mm-hmm. kind of just hoard yeah. her out pretty hard. She was like a dance mom, one of those types. That are oh, just, big uh, time, yeah. Or, or a childhood pageant mom. Right, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, exactly. So, you know... Um, Trish uh, had to endure, like, you know, a childhood of, of that sort of glitz and glamour and her mom and that whole thing, which, you know, if you don't like that lifestyle, then obviously it's hell. Mm-hmm. Um, but she currently uh, is doing a radio show. She's Trish Talk. Um, it's, a, a, it's big news in Hell's Kitchen, you know. Everyone listens to Trish Talk. And um, secretly... You get a few glimpses of her trying to learn martial arts because she basically wants to be like Jessica. She basically wants to be a superhero. And, I mean, in comic book continuity, she becomes the superhero Hellcat. Yeah. uh, Which, you know, you can sort of see that coming in season two because she's already, like, going on missions with jessica and luke and stuff and in, in in the series in the being used as bait <laughs> yeah yeah she's being she's really good at that by the way willingly yeah. doing it all the time yeah exactly she just wants to be on the team she yeah, doesn't yeah. care if she rides the bench she, mm. she like legit just like wants to be a mask vigilante like and just wants to, she 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 could like you know she, she wants she's, to be the bat boy no offense to bat boy no no yeah <laughs> Um, <laughs> basically, she she's a very rich and successful person who could have a nice, relaxing, l- uh, luxurious life, and she does not want that. She wants to live the gritty, violent world that Jessica lives in. Lives a life so, of righteousness. Um, it'll be interesting to see her become Hellcat in season two, which is a prediction of mine. Um, so she's got her, and she's got that lawyer, um, Jerry Hogarth, played by Carrie Ann Moss, um, who, you know, I don't know how you'd really go about saying it. I guess they rub each other's backs is the best way of saying it, you know. They do each other favors. Well, Jessica does the P.I. stuff for her, and then 
she's a lawyer and provides Jessica with representation for whoever it is that Jessica needs representing. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, yeah, Jerry Hogarth is a money-hungry lesbian who, um, well, that's how she's portrayed in the show. Um, I think it was a gender thing. I think Jerry Hogarth was actually a man in Alias, but I, I don't quite remember. No, well, I, I, that's one of those books that I didn't know existed. I guess Brian Michael Bendis really made a name for himself doing Daredevil in that book at the same time. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, it was back during the Marvel Knights days, back when the fringe was kind of called Marvel Knights. Uh, Isn't the... Um, what's that actress? She was Trinity, right? In Matrix? She was, yeah. Okay. Yes. I just wanted to... Uh, yep, she's had an illustrious career in acting. She was in the Matrix series, and a bunch of other shit, and this. Now, she can dodge bullets, yes? <laughs> In the Matrix, in the she Matrix, could. she can, and she can do. In, she in, can run on the walls and everything. In this particular uh, story, she she more or less dodges uh, things like alimony and uh, um, equally as difficult, you know, uh, counter lawsuits mm-hmm. from her ex-wife. Equally as big of a task, right? Because mm-hmm. um, her ex-wife is counter suing her; they're suing each other or whatever. Money yeah, hungry. Because Jessica got drunk and decided that she was going to get her to sign the papers by holding her in front of a moving train, <laughs> and she thought she just. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then she thought like, she wasn't really proud of what she did there, but like, and then in the end, she ends up saving her and like chickens out. That's right. Oh man, I forgot all about that. Yeah, because I haven't seen that. I, I took I did my run through Jessica right when it came out, mm. and I ran right through her all all the episodes like within two days. Did the same thing with Daredevil season two. Uh, finished it in two days. I just couldn't stop watching it. It was like when I'm not doing something, like I'm watching this. I'm excited for Game of Thrones when it comes back. Man. Oh God! I hope, I hope I don't miss it. Well, like, well, we should do a GOT cast at, at some point. Uh, maybe You got it. I got it. Get it? Yeah, I got it. Get got it good. It? Good. Yeah. Yeah. That was a pun. <laughs> yeah. No, but seriously, uh, maybe mid-season. Let, let's let people watch half the season first. And when they right. take, we'll take their break. We'll do a GOT cast. Well, I mean, there's actually plenty to talk about. We're we all we any... all watch that show, like you know. Mm. And I just got a Braun Funko Pop doll. Yeah, and you got me the Tyrion one, which I love, Mm -hmm. and I have it right upstairs and on on my television. And I have a Prince Oberyn just sitting on my cable box. We all have Game of Thrones Funko Pops. We do. He's next to Voltron, which has nothing to do with Game of Thrones. (laughs) Yep. It could, though. You never know. It's next season. <laughs> How pissed off would people be if Voltron. a giant robot warrior descends from the sky at the, at the, at the like the, the series Westeros. finale? The series finale of Game of Thrones is Voltron comes. <laughs> and well, it's like I'm I win the Game of Thrones. <laughs> well, I, if George if if George R R Martin's diabetes doesn't get him uh, before he finishes this goddamn epic series he started, then they might have to do that. Well, apparently so. the uh, the show has surpassed the books. Yeah, which is fucked. Like get, that guy needs to get his his fat ass behind the typewriter and get going. People don't yeah. use typewriters Type anymore. But you know, each book looks like a thousand pages. It's like ridiculous. Yeah, he needs to shorten the books and finish the goddamn story. You know. Yeah. Of course, I know what I'm talking about because I'm a published writer like him. Not. Uh... Now, but seriously, um, Game of Thrones aside, um, let's wrap up here talking about Jessica Jones, and then we're gonna jump into just a little Agents of Shield. Oh, uh, the Marvel. PG universe. Yeah. We could even take a pee break first. All right, well, we can do that. <laughs> if we wanted to. Uh, good idea. All right, to. well, you know. I need to pee. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, all right. It's what, it's what I'm implying. <laughs> Nathan, Nathan, since you need to pee at this point in time, please say your last words that you'd like to say about Jessica Jones, and then you're dismissed to go to the men's room. Fucking smoke show, dude. 
I, I do <laughs> I I do have quite an attraction to Kristen Ritter. I think yeah, yeah. she's she's gorgeous. No, I thought it was awesome. I thought it was like a cool, very very cool, different uh, series. Very kind of pushed the envelope as far as it could go, as far as um, being sort of uh, gruesome and sort of disturbing in a superhero series. Yeah, and I think that's sort of a step in. In in my direction, at least. <laughs> yeah, no, the adult themes are going to attract more adults to watch these more series. More sex and blood, people. Well, uh, you know, uh, it, it, there is a correlation there, you know? Yeah. And they're getting the viewership that they've never had before because they're showing, they're portraying these stories the way they were written in for, the first place. For grown-ups. For, for grown-ups, yeah, <laughs> exactly. All right, go to the little boys' room. Yay! All right, Holden. Last thoughts on Jessica Jones. Um, uh, I haven't completed the show yet. I've got up to episode oh, Jesus. eight. Jesus, I know, dude. It's it's pathetic. I need to watch more TV. Well, I know. You got to get through these shows. I tell you. I know, but uh, as a whole, from what I've seen so far, it's been really good. Um, it's it's also a refreshing point of view. They don't have too many shows like this. They certainly don't. And then they have uh, more freedom to do these type of things because Netflix isn't, uh, they're not crazy about the censorship. There is none. So the, the content that needs to be there is there. Oh, let me tell you, there is no censorship for Netflix. They had this movie on Netflix called Teeth. I don't know if you ever saw it, but it was I- essentially like this horror movie about a chick who had like a vagina that with teeth on it that, uh, and, and to get back at men like she'd like have sex with them and then have her vagina bite off their dicks and like spit them out and like you see like these bloody like penises like being spat all over the screen and this was this was the movie that like Rachel my my uh on again off again girlfriend that she um she showed this movie to me like on one of our very first dates and like i was horrified like (laughs) mortified and like i didn't want to even think about anything to do with sex for like a month after that movie and that movie was on netflix and like if you can show like vaginas with teeth like biting dicks off and spitting them out all across the screen and blood going everywhere then i think netflix is fair game for like almost anything um (laughs) here's a thing that annoys me real quick about um uh nintendo wii does not have um i thought you were going to the bathroom I was yes, I was in the bathroom this whole time. Oh, did you just come back from the bathroom? Yeah, the magic of radio. Wow. I was, yes, I was in the bathroom. I was. I'm actually broadcasting from the bathroom right now. I have the, my <laughs> headphones on. All right. I brought the mic with me. Um, I just wanted to say that Nintendo Wii U does not uh, does not um, it's not able to download the WWE Network. Which very which annoys me very much because it does have Netflix on it. Well, so it's like they're able to put all these adult content things on Netflix. Andrew, do you think it's time that Nathan bought a big boy gaming system? <laughs> I have my yeah. PS3. I have my PS3 still. But oh yeah, well those. That's well, still- buy a PS4 and go to the bathroom. Okay. All right. Are you guys just gonna keep talking? No, I'm just. I'm gonna do you need say to go to the bathroom too, because I'll get out of the bathroom for you guys to go in. <laughs> Well, yeah, we're gonna take we're gonna go on break now. Um, okay. So we talked Daredevil, we talked Jessica Jones. They're great shows. We love them. We'll be right back after this short break Flash. to talk Marvel's Agents of Shield. And we're back. Welcome back. This is the Vigilant Geek Podcast. We are talking Marvel TV. I'm Andrew Puzak. Uh, with me, as always, is... Oh, hold an arm. Hold yep. an arm. Yep. And uh, we also have Vigilant Geek Media Analyst Nathan Burke, uh, New England stand-up comedian Nathan Burke with uh, us here. I finished going to the bathroom. You know, he, he he's all done in the bathroom, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, there's there's some more good news right there. So, um, 
before we went on break so that we could all go to the bathroom, uh, we uh, talked a little Daredevil. Uh, we talked a little Jessica Jones. Uh, I just want to mention some of the other uh, Marvel Netflix series we want to be looking forward to. Um, next up is Luke Cage. Uh, I'm not quite sure on the date of that. I think they're in production as we speak, so we're looking at at least six months from now. Um, I don't know if it'll be too much longer than that, though. They like to put out a new Marvel series on Netflix, or at least a new season of something, about every six months, I want to say. I don't know. The turnaround on Daredevil was, was so quick. Like, for the amount of production value that they actually put into it? Well, they knew the day it went up on Netflix how good it did. You know, like, that's the thing about Netflix is, you know, you can binge watch. So people did so, and, like, just the amount of, of people watching that show, like, they were immediately signed up for a second season, and production started as soon as a script was put together. Someone decided right away... All right, let's get some of these other like awesome fringe characters into this show. Let's get Punisher. Let's get Elektra. Let's get the Hand involved, and then they piece together season two. And yeah, it it started production like you know almost immediately after season one was put out. Um, so you know, I imagine they're getting ready for production now uh, for season three. And, uh, you know, for those of you who have seen season two, you know, Wilson Fisk uh, has been gone, but he's he has not been forgotten. Uh, he has been running his own schemes and games from prison, and he's he's developed quite a bit of power in there in Rikers. Uh, so, you know, that uh, it won't be long before he becomes a threat again. Uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see Bullseye coming up next season. Uh, I think that would be a good move uh, to start including him in some some of these uh, episodes. Uh, and then, you know, who knows who else will show up. But I also would not be surprised if Frank Castle, the Punisher, or Elektra both got their own uh, TV series on Netflix as well. They're strong enough characters where they could definitely hold their own show and, and have it be interesting and, and awesome. Uh, but things that we can look forward to, you know, that are etched in stone, we got Luke Cage coming up next, and then I gotta believe that is going to be the birth of our Heroes for Hire uh, think, did, would it be just Luke Cage and Iron Fist, or do you think they'd include Jessica Jones into that? Unless they called, uh, they just did one show and lumped it together and called it Defenders. Well, that's the end game, I believe, for all these Netflix shows. Is eventually they're going to do a team show called Defenders, and it's going to have all of them. Uh, and at that point, you'll certainly have Jessica Jones there, along with Daredevil, Luke Cage, Iron Fist. Uh, the I don't know if they'd have anyone else. It's up in the air, but uh, but yeah. Um, well, I don't know. I forgot. I lost my train of thought. Um, Agents of Shield. Well, that's what we're getting to. Yeah. What about so, Wolfman? He's not part of this. Leave him out of this, Nathan. <laughs> hear about this Wolfman? They're looking for a new Wolfman at Clark's Trading Post. Wait, what? So you want to? <laughs> are you talking? Are you talking about like Wolfman wanted things you you do to like <laughs> like jobs you look for so that you can like pay for your. Are you trying? Payments? Are you trying to get a new job, man? Like up at Clark's Trading Post? Do you know what a commute that would be? I don't think I could play the Wolfman though. I don't have a wolf. I I think that's like a forty-year-old plus man's job with a long beard. That's like a if John Burke grew a big long beard, maybe. Yeah, he could be a good Wolfman. Yeah, he'd be an awesome Wolfman. Do well, you, you want to hear the uh, the, <laughs> the qualifications to be the new Wolfman at Clark's? All Trading right, Post? let's let, let's hear it. Yeah. Do you have a dramatic style? Do you like the great outdoors? Don't like the typical dress code? Every day is casual Friday for Wolfman. On the exterior, Wolfman must be scruffy and unkempt, but he must be outgoing and good with people. 
get paid to chase trains from your wo- <laughs> from your woodland territory. <laughs> if acting crazy and getting paid for it sounds good, then this is the job for you. I really wish I looked like a wolf man. I wonder what the pay is on that. Yeah, me too. Uh, they, they, I bet they don't have that listed. Grab your eye patch and bring your enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> and head to the Wolfman auditions at Gene's Playhouse. <laughs> oh my lord! You better get on that, Nate. Uh, I wish I wish I was qualified as far as looks wise. I don't f- think I fit the bill. Why not? I need a the Wolfman's like a like an older bum looking. If I had my big beard, maybe still, but I, like he, if you saw a picture of the Wolfman, you, you'd know what I mean. Is this like a like time a honored tr- like area tradition for wherever this Clark's training post is? Yeah, it's um actually Mick Foley talks about it extensively in I think his first book. Like going to Clark's <laughs> training post and he like in like in like hanging out with the Wolfman. Is it like near Why? Killer Kowalski's wrestling school or something? No, it's up in uh um, It's like up in the White Mountains. Yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah, it's up by it's uh <laughs> let me, let me see. Yeah. The Kanga Mangus Highway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah okay. Link, uh, Lincoln, it's up by Lincoln, New Hampshire. All right, let us know how that goes, Nathan. <laughs> okay, I just thought I'd throw that in. Um, if anyone's looking for work, that's our my plug for a <laughs> Clark's Trading Post. <laughs> if any of our listeners look like the Wolfman. Oh God. They probably do. I'm sure a lot of you. I'm sure most of them do. I would hope. Yeah. So, uh, Agents of Shield, shall we? Yeah, it's time. So it's that's another uh, Joss Whedon um, creation. Creation. I believe he's pretty much in charge of the show. Oh um, yeah, that's his baby. Yeah, I knew. I mean, you could tell. Like the show kind of has his fingerprints all over it. Just the way the characters interact has the same feel of like everything else that I've watched of his, like Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Yeah. And, uh, Firefly and right, the Avengers. Yeah. So yeah, um, but you know, it it's it's been nothing short of uh, exciting for sure uh, in the past uh, season and a half. Now, the first season they were a little slow at the stack gate, and I wasn't sure if the show was going to last because it just I don't know. I know for a fact it didn't grip me by like episode five or six. I was I was ready to pitch it, and I think uh, most other people were feeling the same way. The first half of season one felt like they were taking way too long with just like telling a bunch of random stories so that you could develop these characters so you could like attempt to give a shit exactly and then but like the only way you're going to do that is if you tell a compelling story which didn't pick up until the whole tie-in with winter soldier captain america winter soldier yeah that was like when everything changed and got cool um because they then they they had a reason to you know link the show with uh, you know the Marvel Cinematic Universe you know and that whole uh, Hydra infiltration of Shield and Shield becoming compromised I mean that was something that they could use to you know uh, inject some life back into the the, the show and, and you started to kind of care about Coulson especially. Um, and then they had the Deathlock story arc, which was neat, where, uh, you know, another popular character from Marvel, uh, which I still feel is underutilized, he should be on the team. Uh, Isn't he in the book? In the book, he is, yeah. In the book, Deathlock is part of the team. Like, you have Agent May and, like, Fritz and Simmons and the whole gang, and you also have Deathlock, which makes complete sense, and I love it. Uh I don't know. They should be doing that in the show, and they're not. But the uh, when, when, when uh, Agents of Shield really started to c- pick up and, and and cook with a little bit of gas was definitely when they started this whole Inhuman thing, and they've really been pushing the Inhumans since then. Yeah, season two was a, a, a great accomplishment for them. Um, it I. I didn't watch all of season one. I think I watched like a couple of the first episodes, and then I just kind of skipped the second half because it was just like, 
I don't know. I was, I was getting bored, and I didn't like it. But uh, then I, get, I picked it up again at the beginning of season two, and it's just been... And it was great, because they incorporated the Inhumans, and um, and they did a really good job with it. And it was interesting, and they're, they're doing more stuff with introducing stuff that was in the, the comics that hasn't been portrayed yet on the screen. Right. And then they've also done a better job of... Um, having the show be the direct link to the uh, the actual movie continuity. Because th- that's what it's supposed to be part of. Exactly. Exactly. And, uh, you know, ev- they don't do it enough, I feel. I feel like they could do more with that as well. But every time there's, like, a big movie event, like, you, like your Age of Ultron or your Captain America Winter Soldier or Civil War, which is coming up soon, I'm sure we'll hear something about that. Oh, there should be a tie-in. Although there wasn't much of a tie-in for the second season. They just they kind of talked about, like, there was one episode aired on one day and then the, the next episode the following week, like, acknowledged that it happened, but they didn't talk about it because they wanted people to go see the movie. Yeah. Like, they, they, um, they'll say a few things about it, but they, I mean, that's sort of what I was getting at, is it it wasn't, you know, enough of a tie-in for me as a fan. Um, you know, mentioning, you know, like, oh, Ultron's coming, call in the Avengers, and then that's it. It's just kind of like, you... You sons of bitches, you're just, you're trying to tease us is what you're doing. We're seeing what you're doing, God damn it. and I'm going to see your movie anyways. Give me a little more than that. Well, that's, it's, you know, give de- me more than that. You're, you're definitely s- going to go see the movie. It's just give me a reason to if watch the television show, you know? Well, that that too, especially. But, you know, if you're an avid watcher of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., you're going to be seeing, you're going to go to all the Avengers events, uh, you know, the big movies on screen. And so it's like, you know... We're already going to see the goddamn movie. Give us more than that. Give us more than Coulson on the phone. Call in the Avengers. And then nothing. That's it. Well, actually, that's one of the things that's kind of irritating me. Because that I, the Avengers still think he's dead. From the first film. From the first Avengers movie. Coulson. <laughs> they just was, think he's dead. Still? I think so, yeah. Cause I, I think you're I, right, actually. I yeah. haven't seen anything to the... like. I don't know. Eventually, they just be like, "Oh, Coulson was just a ghost." I was like, "How does that explain the other seasons before?" Jerks. Well, hopefully, like Coulson's a character that can easily be in like, I I mean, for all we know, he could be in Civil War. I don't believe he is, but I mean, he could be. Um, but he's somebody they could stick in Infinity War easily. They mentioned. Uh, I read an article online that said sixty-eight. Marvel marquee characters are going to be featured in Infinity War, parts one and two. 68 characters. Where are they going to... Well, they have them. I mean, but I mean, don't be surprised if some of those 68 characters are going to be pulled from your Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and your uh, Netflix series characters, because they are. And all of those characters, might I add... The characters from Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. as well as, so, so like, you know, your Daisy Johnsons, your Earthquakes, your Mockingbirds, your Bobby Morses, uh, what have you. Or, you know, Daredevil, Jessica Jones, Luke Cage and Iron Fist. They're all going to be summoned to the mighty Infinity War. Don't be surprised to see them on the big screen because they're going to be there. That would be awesome. And that's what's going to happen. And that's going to be like the big reveal for I Marvel. for that. Yeah. What so I, so the- Coulson reuniting in, with the Avengers, you know, that's something that they better damn well cover before then or at least, you know, by the time of the Infinity War. Do you think they might do it in the movie and then have that big connection? Just because I feel like... Maybe, maybe. Having the Avengers as they are now, the lineup now, all like having an episode of Agents of Shield where they all find out where Coulson is, they all find him and then confront him, and then, and then it's just um, Fitz and Simmons like with their little crushes on on the Avengers, like oh my god, I'm talking to Captain America. And <laughs> Chris Evans is like, I'm drinking coffee. Yeah, you know, not for nothing, but you know, they got those actors locked into those contracts to play those characters. 
there's got to be a way to utilize that and force them. Like, you're doing a fucking episode of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Captain America liaisons with S.H.I.E.L.D. in the books constantly. So your ass needs to be there at least one episode a season, just like Nick Fury and uh, Maria Hill should be there, like, you know, half in every episode at or least. at least half the time. You know, Maria Hill, like, where's she? You know, for that matter, where's Nick Fury? We, we mentioned how, you know, in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., S.H.I.E.L.D., since it was compromised, is so small and it's almost like a splinter cell of what it, S.H.I.E.L.D. used to be. I mean, where's Maria Hill? Like, why isn't she, like, running things or helping out or, like, I feel like the Avengers... where's Nick? Where's Nick Fury? Well, in, in Age of Ultron, uh, Maria Hill was like, uh, like new job was being the Avengers liaison. Oh, okay. Yeah, she was more of like a dress clothes type of person to go bump shoulders All right. with politicians. All right, that gets her off the hook. What about Fury? He was in hiding, trying to regroup everybody from the shadows because Captain America made him promise that S.H.I.E.L.D. would disband. And huh. he was he was probably busy trying to sneak into another franchise, Samuel Jackson, so they couldn't <laughs> they couldn't have him on the show. He didn't have the time. He had a yeah. He's in everything, man. He was a like... smart man. Like I'd want to be part of every major franchise. Yeah, Just... it's like Star Wars, bring it on. Friggin' <laughs> the next Tarantino flick. Yeah, I'll do that. Damn it! I think he holds some sort of record for most. Uh, Marvel, you want me to play Nick Fury? Motherfucker, sign me up! Like he's been in the most movies, or like he, I think someone may have beaten him recently or something like that. But he, I think he holds some sort of record for being in the most movies or making the most, the highest grossing actor, maybe. Like being in the most high grossing movies of all time, or something. Okay, like that. yeah. He weasels his way into everything. He was in RoboCop, uh, the remake, RoboCop remake. What else? They just cut to him. He's like. Damn! <laughs> Robocop, like Star it. Wars, Marvel Universe. Yeah. A bunch of Tarantino, <laughs> Django Unchained. Yep. Uh, Pulp Fiction. And then Pulp, obviously Jackie Pulp Brown. Fiction, Jackie Brown. And then like other big franchises, it's just a matter of time before he gets into Star The new Trek one, Hateful or... Eight. I mean, Hateful which I, which Eight. I still haven't seen for some reason. Is it on DVD yet or no? Yeah, yeah I, I was so. hoping to do the Tarantino cast before. After we all saw that, we'll yeah, talk we more should. about that. That's that's we like should all see it before we do that. Yeah. Okay. We'll we'll, we'll have a movie night. What I what I was I'll bring say. the popcorn. <laughs> the oh, Avengers. Yeah. The Avengers series is almost turning into Super Smash Brothers. It's like who's gonna be in the next one? Oh uh, yeah. Until the oh, roster yeah. gets so huge that you're just like. Uh, and then you gotta get like other characters from other franchises. So I'm just hoping Brock Lesnar's in the next Avengers movie. <laughs> <laughs> just suplexing everybody. They have to like Suplex City bitch and he's just like suplexing. There's like a hundred a hundred some odd Avengers and they're like, uh, oh, let's start using WWE people. <laughs> yeah. John I, Cena, you're an Avenger. A CGI com- equipment will get Brock Lesnar and paint him green. He can Undertaker- be the new Hulk. Undertaker has lightning powers. He could do that. He lightning <laughs> Undertaker. It's has been a wire. He does. he does. When they played the supernatural angle, mm-hmm. yeah. Kane has fire powers. You know, I don't like it when they do the supernatural. angle. I love angle. it. Yeah. I love it. I love over gimmicky bullshit. I love it so much. It's so stupid, but I like it. I, and like the Bray Wyatt stuff is fantastic. What when he slowly walks out with that lantern? Yeah, and he's like, and he made like a hologram of himself to like distract Dean Ambrose that one time. Yeah, if he's going to be like such a like the headlining heel guy, like he needs to somehow steal the WWE heavyweight title and then not defend it for an entire year. Oh, and he made that possessed child go out and distract John Cena. <laughs> Do you remember that? No. Yeah. This it is a like, great. This would be like much cooler. No, nah, yeah, so he uh If I'd if I'd known that stuff, this stuff's kind of Kind of neat, but then again, like, when is too much? Too much, you know. I my my philosophy is it's wrestling, and it's I feel like as long as it's not too like insane, then like is because this is the it's like the wrestling loophole. Like you, as long as it's under the guise of mind games, quote unquote, like head. It's like oh, he's playing mind games with him, you know. 
it's like it's okay because then it, it, it still keeps it in reality no nah, i mean if i'm gonna watch power stuff like gotta be movies or uh cartoons i feel cartoons i think is the best medium to go ahead and portray superpowers but if undertaker strikes lightning on the stage to like throw someone off i, I it, yawn and then wait for the match it's, to, like, it's like start uh, it's like then then it's mind games he's playing mind games with them He's playing. You know, he he talked to someone in the pyrotechnics department and paid him off. Yeah, that's it's like type of thing. But they don't say that. They're like, "Oh my God, the Undertaker summoned lightning from the bowels of his hellish anus." And <laughs> like, exactly. Oh. Well, the under. It's the like Ultimate the mood in here is. Oh, you could hear a pin drop and hear a cat screw or, or something. It, like. Well, the Ultimate Warrior mid-match in WrestleMania 7 against Randy Savage uh, spoke to the gods to ask them if he should step down as Intercontinental Champion. So he, so. Did it, so he didn't lose? <laughs> he, yeah. He, <laughs> that he is chose the, to step down? Yeah. And, that, he, he's that, a, <laughs> and Gorilla Monsoon's commentary is great on that. He's asking them if he should step down. <laughs> he, he's speaking to the gods. That guy was out of his great. fucking mind because yeah. he got up after five elbow smashes. How, you know how are you supposed to? Ex- how are you gonna explain that aside from something supernatural, huh? Getting up after five elbow smashes. And he just couldn't do anything, and then he finally had to ask the gods if he should yeah. give it up because he's the ultimate warrior yeah. and can't lose. Eh, yeah, five elbow smashes. For that that loud. doesn't impress me much. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> yeah. Don't get me wrong, I think you're all right, but that won't keep me warm in the middle of the night. So you got up after five <laughs> elbow smashes. <laughs> that don't impress me much. Ooh, ooh, yeah. <laughs> Woo! Then Ultimate Warrior cuts a weird pro bow on Shania Twain. <laughs> all right, um... Sorry. We were talking about something here today. I think it was... Well, I guess this is how compelling Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is. Hey, no. Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. has been a pretty sick show since season two onward. Um, Let's hit some major points here before we get off topic again. Um, Let's talk the uh, evolution of Daisy Johnson becoming Earthquake uh also uh you know you have another major uh avengers character in mockingbird that has joined the team and she like never ever tells the truth but she's hot and she carries a big st- a couple of big sticks yeah how what what in humans have been um introduced i know lash was introduced but oh well that's season 3 um yeah but season 3 you know we we end season 2 um big showdown on the secret shield hel- uh aircraft carrier right right against the inhumans the inhumans are going to go ahead and you use the Terrigen on uh, everybody on board so that they can find out who's an inhuman and everyone else can just die. And then Exactly. And then Coulson gets his hand cut off. Coulson becomes Captain Hook. And uh but yeah, uh Shield prevails. And uh then we have season three and someone is well actually more than one entity is hunting down the inhumans. Um you have uh, that inhuman task force uh, with that lady who's just kind of bitchy, for lack of a better term. Um, I don't know. So you have that task force that's clearly like Hydra undercover. It's like so obvious. Um, but they're a government task force hunting down in humans because they're dangerous and the Terrigen mists have gotten out and people, ordinary humans, are turning into inhumans. And But since they have alien DNA in them now, uh, people are afraid and they, they're calling them aliens. And uh, one of the big inhuman characters from season two, Lincoln, 
uh, is being hunted by the government and being hunted by Lash. Lash is this inhuman creature. He's blue and he's got kind of like dreadlocks. And uh, the task force is sicking him on inhumans to try to... uh, take them out you know because lash is like this crazy strong killing machine um but he can teleport so he's hard to catch he can teleport well he's an inhuman himself but his his ability i believe is he uh he can absorb like the life force of other inhumans specifically oh wow i didn't know that i don't know i i caught one episode of season three and it turned out that it was uh this was actually a pretty informative episode. Like a lot of oh, okay. plot stuff happened. Uh, I guess May's ex husband uh, accidentally got hit by Terrigen Mist after he looked at the uh, the book that had the list of names of all the Inhumans in it. Yeah, all the um, unactive ones, the ones mm-hmm. that haven't been activated through Terrigen. Yeah. Um. So it turned. He gets hit in the face with this, and then he st- he. He starts changing, and he's the one who's actually Lash. He is Lash. Well, I didn't get that far. Um, yeah, I'm only, like I said, I'm only about six episodes deep uh, in, into season three. I got a little catching up to do. But, um, oh, that's interesting, then. Interesting development. Um, but Lash is a pretty interesting character that they have for the show. I Was he in any like comic book continuity before? Or? He was actually recently created. Um, when Inhumanity finished up, there was the Inhumans book. Uh-huh. Which, or I forget what they called it. Was it Inhumanity? I don't know. And it had to deal with uh, how... Um, Adelon and the Sky City of the Inhumans went ahead and crashed in New York. So now, in the middle of New York Harbor, you got this giant ancient city from of the like filled of Inhumans. So there's this city state that is its own private country, um, separate from the United States within the New York City. And Lash is was a character who was trying to recruit and find other Inhumans to go ahead and get enough people so we could rise up and go ahead and conquer uh, the city. But then Medusa ends up finding him, and Medusa's hair powers are just, like, overpowered, and Lash couldn't hang, and she she took the kids back and united them. And, but he's, he's a relatively new character as far as I knew. Okay. Oh, interesting. Okay, I'm learning... Learning about the Inhumans every day, I feel. They're being pushed harder and harder by the day, but uh, they're pretty interesting characters as a whole. Uh, And I am uh, a fresh, new, amateur, novice reader of the uh, Uncanny Inhumans book, um, which we'll get into next week when we do our Marvel Comics universe update um but yeah pretty cool stuff and i feel like uh agents of shield has been an excellent vessel to uh you know get these inhumans uh some media exposure and uh get people interested in perhaps reading the books and you know because there is going to be there's an inhumans film slated uh for years down the road, I, I I'm not quite sure when exactly, but uh, it's coming. Uh, so I think you know, generate as much interest as possible. Uh, the show's definitely doing wonders for that. Mm. So also in the books, I be- I, I feel like they're going to end up doing um, an X Men versus Inhumans arc. Like I just feel like it's oh it's it's brewing. You can tell because the mutants are suffering because of the Terrigen mists. They're being killed off, and they're not and happy sterilized. about it. And if you read the Uncanny X-Men book right now, it's all about that, and it's all about Magneto's take on the whole thing, and pretty much, like, what Magneto plans to do to the Inhumans, you know? And it's not, nice. you know, he's, he's, he's not going to show up at their doorstep with a freshly, you know, a baked pan of brownies or something or or a welcome to the neighborhood jello mold no 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 he's gonna show up and raise some hell you know so we'll be on the lookout for that you know? right. uh, yes 
That's it with that, though. Just a taste. Just a taste for next week. Yeah, next week we'll really get into the meat and potatoes. and It might be a long one, but a good one. we got a lot of great stuff from Marvel to talk about. But um, I suppose let's wrap up our Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. discussion here. Um, I suppose it's worth mentioning that we're both currently trying to check out agent carter they just took it off netflix so that was my avenue um i'm gonna try hulu or amazon i know we'll be able to find the episodes there but um it looks good it's sort of like shields you know post world war ii times you know i love marvel's time capsule stuff oh it's great the, the first captain america movie was great that was all time capsule. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and then uh, and then they do it again with uh, an Ant Man with Oh with Hank Pym. With Hank Pym when they're doing his flashbacks and stuff. Oh it's yeah. It's amazing. They Ah. Uh, yeah, dude. They they need to kind of do get in the way back machine. I like it when they do this stuff. I, I love past. it. I love I'll, it. And I loved it when they did it in X Men first class too, even though it wasn't really Marvel, but it was still a Marvel property and I feel it should count. Oh yeah, Marvel properties count. They they might not be technically part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but they always count. And anytime we talk Marvel movies, we mention those Fox uh, properties as well, those X Men's and those Fantastic Fours and what have you. So um, yeah, great stuff. I mean, right now with Marvel TV, you can't go wrong with anything they have out. Um, haven't seen Agent Carter, like we said. You I've, know, I've heard it's it's better than Agents of Shield. Really? Wow. Well, wow. they're mini series too. You, the production quality and storytelling is probably better too. They don't have full seasons. Like it's like six episodes every time it comes out. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, no, it's come come and goes pretty quick. Well, we're gonna get our hands on Agent Carter, literally and figuratively speaking, and uh, we'll let you know how that goes, both literally and figuratively speaking. Um, but yeah, um, can't wait to give you guys an update again soon. Uh, in regards to Marvel TV, we will talk more about Daredevil next time. We will talk more Jessica Jones. We will talk Luke Cage by then. That'll be out. We will talk anything else. Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., Agent Carter, you name it. If it's Marvel and it's television and it's Marvel television... Vigilant Geek Media is all over that. So I want to thank you guys for listening. I want to thank Vigilant Geek Media analyst, stand-up comedian Nathan Burke for being on the show. Thank you. We also want to thank my comic book partner in crime, Holden Orm. Hey! And as always, remember to stay stay vigilant. vigilant.